Hello, and welcome to another episode of SSD and DRAM News, sponsored by a Pacer. This is the February episode, and as always, it's hosted by yours truly, Frank Henville. And we're coming to you from our beautiful headquarters here in Taipei, Taiwan. We've got quite a few interesting stories this month to share with you. So with that said, let's start the show. Our first story this month is quite a positive one coming from Japan and from uh, places uh, far above your head, really. Uh, you probably heard of the manufacturer known as Kiyoshia, which was previously known as Toshiba. They've been in the flash memory industry for a very, very long time, since around the beginning. And uh, they had a bit of a tough year last year. They tried to do a merger, which didn't go through. But as I said, this is uh, some positive news showing what they can, what they're still capable of. Uh, the story that, according to our sources, said that Kioxia recently sent more than 130 terabytes of SSD-based storage to the International Space Station. They worked together with uh, Hewlett Packard in order to assemble a device known as the HPE Spaceborne Computer 2. This is a small but powerful supercomputer with uh, multiple SSDs connected to it. And its main function is to process the data gathered by the astronauts and scientists on the International Space Station before that data is sent down to Earth. Uh, in fact, according to the team working on the supercomputer, it's powerful enough to reduce the amount of data that needs to be transmitted by up to 30,000 times. So if you can reduce your download file size by that much, it's going to definitely speed things up and make the whole process of doing science in space a lot faster and easier. So 130 terabytes uh, sounds like a lot in the world of supercomputing that might actually be considered small. And according to Hewlett Packard's engineers, uh, the Spaceborne Computer 2 was mostly based on commercial off-the-shelf technology. So they didn't uh, create any special custom hardware for this. They just uh, used products that were already available on the open market. So it's quite an achievement, and they say that the Spaceborne Computer 2 will be working on various uh, data workloads, some of them related to healthcare, uh, recovery from natural disasters, 3D printing, 5G communications, AI, and various others. So it just goes to show you uh, the, the race to improve computers is not just a terrestrial one, but is going on in space as well. And in fact, uh, due to the limitations of uh, working in space or the, the differences between a space-based environment and the normal gravity of Earth, they determined that HDDs would not be properly able to function in the International Space Station, so uh, SSDs were chosen as an option. So that's quite an interesting story, and uh, the, of course the International Space Station has been running for years and uh, is quite a, a powerful international collaboration between nations, so we hope for their continued success. Okay, so moving on to uh, another, maybe slightly darker story. This one is going to have some uh, conflicting emotions, so you may need to decide for yourself which of the parties you want to believe, since uh, some of the issues here are not completely clear, not completely resolved. So uh, the news came to us near the beginning of the month of February that the Pentagon in the United States had added more Chinese technology firms to a list. That list is known as 1260H, and it's a list of companies that the Pentagon believes are tied or connected to the Chinese military, or they provide products that are used in the Chinese military-industrial complex. 
So uh, there's been multiple companies added to that list over the years, but in the storage industry, the big news was that YMTC, one of the largest and most advanced 3D NAND makers in China, had been added to that list. Uh, so that means that uh, YMTC would be barred from buying advanced chip-making equipment based on U.S. intellectual property. Uh, that may not affect them today, but as the science of chip making advances, it would mean that in the future they would be unable to make uh, the smaller and more compact uh, storage devices that the market will be demanding. So, uh, again, uh, that was the Pentagon's decision to add them to that list. And uh, a few days after that announcement came out, uh, YMTC responded, and according to their uh, spokesperson, they said, quote, We have not supplied or been directed by any entity to supply our technology for military use, end quote. Uh, that's what they said to a Reuters reporter. So uh, the Pentagon said they do supply the Chinese military. YMTC said, no, we don't. And as I said, the result is not really clear, but they're on the Pentagon's list anyway, and it may be a while before they are able to get off it. So uh, YMTC was having a great year last year with the uh, announcements at some of its very high level, I think it was 292 levels of uh, memory storage on one particular device and uh, another technological achievements but that's got to be a setback for them in early 2024, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, and on to our final story for today. Uh, if you've been following a pacer over the years recently, you'll notice we have multiple products that uh, are branded with the word core in the beginning of their name. So we had uh, Core Power and Core Analyzer previously, and... Last year, I was talking quite a bit about Core Snapshot, which is a backup and recovery technology for SSDs that was developed by a pacer. And now there's a new technology that's sort of an addition to Core Snapshot, and we've named it Core Rescue. So Core Rescue features ASR, or auto self-recovery. Uh, this is how it works. If, uh, if an admin decides to install the Core Rescue uh, function within Core Snapshot, they double click the icon and run a manual backup to, to set the technology to active. Then they would need to set a number from between two and five. Uh, this number, for, for now, let's just assume this number is set to three. So over the next couple of weeks, Core Rescue will monitor how long it takes for an average boot to complete after a power cycle. You will eventually learn how long an average boot should take. Then, if there are three consecutive boots that take signif significantly longer than average, Core Rescue will run the auto self-recovery process. That will mean the next boot restores the backed up data and the boot will complete normally. So this is quite uh, useful, especially in uh, areas such as healthcare, or in uh, point of sale or display devices that are customer facing and need to be always on, always working. If, if, uh, if a customer facing display goes down and you got a blue screen of death, it looks very unprofessional and the customers can't get whatever information they were hoping to get from that board. But if you had Core Rescue installed and the system detected that the boot was taking longer than usual, and it happened three times, then, or however many times you had set it to uh, auto-recover, then uh, the system will be back up and running, and uh, you wouldn't have any problems with your display showing the blue screen of death. So we've just really uh, begun to promote Core Rescue here at Pacer. There'll be some videos on our YouTube channel, and if there are more functions added to it this year, I'll be sure to mention them on this podcast, but if you're interested in learning more, you can contact an Apacer representative because the product is ready and shipping, 
And uh, if you if you need it, it's it's ready to help you out. So yeah, if you if you need to contact your APESA representative and ask them about Core Rescue. Okay, well, it looks like that's all the time we have for today. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, I can see we we currently have listeners in quite a few continents from around the world, and uh, we're always gaining new listeners. So we really appreciate your support. Uh, as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, we're happy to take your questions on here. If you have any, you can always email me. My email address is frank underscore h-e-n-v-i-l-l-e at apacer.com. And I would be happy to uh, answer any question you have. If it's something I can't answer, I'll ask one of my knowledgeable teammates to help me out and we'll be sure to address it. So yes, thanks again for tuning in. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next month. Goodbye.